Hello, and welcome to Up Close with yours truly, Colin Thompson. Featured in this special edition are some of the most iconic players and teams that have left an indelible mark on the annual Cup Match Classic. So I encourage you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. As one former cricketer simply put it, Cup Match is much more than just a game. It is a tradition and an integral part of Bermuda's culture. Since its inception in 1902, the annual match pitting Somerset Cricket Club against East End rival St George's Cricket Club has evolved into the biggest and most iconic event on the local sporting calendar. It is for this reason and others many aspire to play in cup match. My grandfather was, um, you know, played cup match. He was the longest serving captain uh, ever in cup match. Uh, my grandfather Warren Simmons, my uncle Lloyd. Uh, was uh, captain of uh, Somerset as well. And my father uh, was one of the best wicket keepers that they've been, uh, and he played for uh, uh, for Somerset. So, hey, no question about it. You know, uh, uh, in my house, in my family, uh, cup match was uh, was it. And from a yeah, from a little boy, I, I was I was going to play cup match. I grew up wanting to play cup match. And on Cup Match Day, you know, I'd be up here listening to the radio and all of that. And I dreamed about the time that I would play Cup Match. And watching the cricketers when I was growing up, playing in, in, in the annual Cup Match class, that was, for a young boy, the big game of the season. At that time, Bermuda wasn't very much into the uh, international scene as we so developed over a period of time. But yeah, that was, that was a game that everybody wanted to be in and be at. Because as a little kid growing up, um, on the boundary edge of Wellington Oval, I used to watch Dennis and Lloyd and Rupert, Scotland and um, persons that I idolized. So obviously it was a dream of mine to always play cup match. And when I was 15, I scored cup match for Joel Brown. And then the very next year at 16, I was blessed to um, be afforded that opportunity to play cup match. And I, I remember that day at Wellington Oval walking up with Dennis Greenway as, as a youngster opening the beginnings and the electric um, atmosphere that was there in front of it, and it definitely was an honor. And I always recognized the fact that it was the special game in Bermuda, and I, I treated it like such every year. Over the years, Cup Match has featured many great teams, among them a star studded St. George's team that achieved an unprecedented eight victories in nine years under the leadership of Captain Calvin Bommy Simons during the 1960s. That was one of the greatest teams that I think. St. George's ever had, or Bermuda, cup machines Bermuda ever had. We had uh, players in the team that were the top players in the clubs, and some of us, were, we were captains in our clubs. So we know the responsibility, we knew that what was required of us, uh, which made it very easy for the one that was leading us. Every game we played, we felt that we were going to win. Well, I used to play the game before I got there. That night, I used to dream about when I reach 50, when I reach 75, I used to dream about making a century. In other words, I felt like I was going to make a lot of runs. And, I mean, I, I hate to say this, but sometimes waiting to go in, I was hoping that one of the batsmen would get out so I can come into bed. The team harmony, that was a key. Um, it was like a a family, and no time did I ever come across any like any arguments or, or any jealousy or everyone was, like, was rooting for one another. So when you went out to bat, you felt the team behind you like they wanted you to make runs. You're bowling, they wanted you to, to get, take wickets and um, so um, it was one happy family at, at that time. Cricket is a funny game, you're up today and down tomorrow, but we, you must prolong, keep on Going, 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 till we get it right. And we had top players. At that time, St. George's had about, if they represent the country, St. George's always had eight players in, in, in the Bermuda team. How I selected a team, I got four batsmen, my first four batsmen, especially bats. They have to make runs. Five, six, and seven mile all rounders. Eight 
could be my Ricky Keep batsman, or the opening back could be Ricky Keep. But 9, 10, and 11 is my special bowlers. That's all they do, bowl. That's why we became a team. I changed teams around, and I saw a player is not up to the par. I'll go to him and tell him that uh, you're going to have to be dropped this year because you're not up to par. And I have no problem dealing with him, talking to him that way. It is often said that behind every great team is a great leader. And, according to those who either had the privilege of playing with or against him, Simons was all that and then some. He is a born leader. Um, he had a lot of um, experienced players. He had a lot of great players. But once you get great players together, you got to know how to handle them. Because um, when Bombay was captain, there was no intimacy, there was no jealousy or no arguments. As far as he was concerned, he, was, he had balance. He was a real leader. And in my explanation, he is the best leader that Bermuda's ever produced. I don't think we could have had a better leader than the head, Cal Simons. He knew how to get the best out of the players. And that's what made him such a great, a great captain. He knew uh, he didn't have to use you know, the bully tactics. He didn't have to, he just let you know what's expected of you. And, and, and you performed. I never heard him run down a player. Like, you know, some captains get on to you. You miss it, Captain, but not Bobby. Always encouragement to his players. And that's what I, I like, I missed him when he went, and of course I didn't stay many years after that because it wasn't the same. And I'm not saying the other guys, you know, the other guys were good, but they couldn't match up to Bobby's leadership. He was a great, great player. Um, a fieldsman, he could feel any slips, the cover point, he could feel any, any position. And he could take the ball and break a partnership. And then he'd give it back to whoever was, was, was on before him and go on and do your job. Somebody looked like they were getting set and he would take the ball and I said, no, no. I, said I, I would say to myself, why in the world is Bummy going on? But he always broke up the partnership. I mean, always. Because Summers were taking a lot of licks, and Bummy, uh, Bummy Summers was captain, and, and, and you know, Bummy had, had um, uh, instilled some fear. Well, we like it or not, Bummy instilled fear in, in, uh, in people, and of course, he had Parfit with him, and, and, and Parfit was, uh, you know, at the time, the most, and, and continued to be the most devastating bowler probably that we've ever seen in Cup Match. Uh, and so, you know, they had those two things going, you know, the kind of leadership that Bummy had, which was like relentless. Um, you know, Bummy didn't ease up on you. If he had you down, he's going to finish you out kind of thing. But I learned a lot, and people don't know this, but I learned a lot from Bummy. A uh, good ball, and this was up. He said it should be out. It's up in the air, Matt. Oh, the fielder just made a diving attempt, and I should say it really was a valid effort. Even though it was a historic win, a really great win, Many did not expect for a victory that day. I can remember like even in displaying my St. George Collars, you go out and a lot of people wouldn't wear the collars if they were Somerset. After holding on to the coveted trophy for 19 consecutive years, St. George's' reign as champions came to a grinding halt in 1979 when Randy Horton's formidable Somerset team pulled off a thrilling victory at Somerset Cricket Club. We certainly had the best team, uh, but we had to do the right things, you know, on the field. No matter whether you have the best team or not, you know, when you're playing it, uh, you have to do the things that are right. And, and I think the, uh, the important thing is that we went into the match, we had a plan. Uh, we were very confident, obviously, um, you know, with the, almost the whole Bermuda team, we had to be confident. Uh, and uh, so we were very confident going in. Uh, we had a game plan, uh, and it all went, um, went just as we would like it to go. When I won the toss, uh, I won the toss, and we uh, went in to bat. Uh, and we batted, we declared at 272, I think it was 272 for four. Uh, and that too, that created some a bit of disturbance amongst not the team, uh, but some spectators and some people thought, uh, because at the time that I declared, uh, John Tucker was on 84. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that's not that far 
uh, from a century. Uh, but you know, we had made our plan in terms of the time that we were going, we had to make certain runs and, and we had set a time. Uh, and um, who knows what uh, the extra 16 runs they could have come, they could have taken a long time, it could have been time that we lost, but we, had, we went by the plan. Uh, and certainly it didn't, I was not happy <laughs> to declare with John on 84, uh, but because John was playing a beautiful innings. Uh, and um, we, you know, for the team, if we were going to win, that was what we uh, decided was going to be necessary to do. That second innings, that made me, made me better. We wanted to make a declaration. And I often talk to John Tuck and say, John, I'm sorry, but because John was on 80, 82 and he wanted his first cup mid century. So I went out there and I said, John, I've been, I've been sent out to let you know. We want to make a quick declaration. So if you're going to go to a century, get there quickly. So I got the strike and I gave him a single and he got down that end and he took a single and put me back down there. So I so went down the street <laughs> crease and I told him again, yeah, John, if you're going to get a century, get it quickly. So anyway, he gained another single. So at that point I said, well, I'm going to have to let loose. And that's when Alden was on the ball and, and I got 30 something in the next six, seven balls and that was a declaration so John was left on 82 and uh, I often, when we talk about cricket, I often apologize that mate, I probably stopped you from getting your century but hey, I gave you the opportunity man. The captain had a goal. The goal was get runs and declare the innings. And when I was out there betting, um, I think Culling just got out and Al James came in. And you know, I, if I made about one or two singles, and that's about it. Uh, I didn't get much strike off the bowling, and so Al took advantage and he hit the ball all, all over the club, all outside the boundary. So I was just down there like a third umpire looking. You know, I probably could have felt that I could have got a little more strike because at that time, I was, I was hitting the ball extremely well. After declaring their innings, Somerset snatched three wickets before close of play to put St. George's on the back foot. Somerset eventually dismissed St. George's for 200 runs the next day, which gave them a 72-run first innings lead that was extended to 214 runs after they declared their second innings at 142 for eight. Uh, when we went back in, uh, again, we're pushing, we're looking at time, so we went in pushing for runs. Uh, and we declared at uh, 142 for eight. Uh, we had lost eight wickets and um, uh, declared at 142 for eight. Al James and Joe Bailey, I think, scored 31 each. They were the high scorers. Um, and so now we're set. We got, you know, we have we've given ourselves uh, it was sufficient time to give us to uh, to bowl uh, to bowl St George's uh, St George's out. Uh, as it was, we bowled them out for. Um, uh, for 73, and that was uh, that was pretty exciting. I'll tell you the the um, and and the best bowling uh, came from Coach Rock. Coach Rock claimed five for 25, and and the the the, the wicket uh, that stands out in my mind, and I think the the, the thing that really turned the match and put it uh, in our favor, uh, because Noel and, and Cleavy Wade were batting, and and you know they were they were batting fairly steadily, uh, and. Um, I was thinking about making a change, and and um, I remember got the players suggested that hey, Coach Rod is the, you know, we we talked to each other, and, and we felt that Co was the man, and Co came on, uh, and Co uh, had uh, no Gibbons uh, um, caught that slip. He's caught a first slip by Winston Reed, an absolutely magnificent. I've never seen a catch like it. Reed caught the ball. The ball had already gone past him, you know, when he. Uh, you know, his hand uh, was able to, to, to reach that ball and know, and once no was gone, uh, then we, you know, we really put the pressure on St. George's and, and um, they couldn't succumb to it. We, we had them out for um, 12 for 73, we won by 141 runs. We had been together for some time because eight of the guys that played in the team came out of the ICC 11. So the unity and the camaraderie and, and the understanding was going was right there. So we just had to go on the field and put that plan together. And and you know we we batted well, we fielded well, they bowled well. Catches win matches, and I, I I don't think any catch went down. And the pressure was 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 uh, uh, enormous. You know, Coach Trot was bowling well, Robin Hines bowling well, Al James, 
It was an unbelievable experience. Colin Blaze came and took some wickets in between. The board coach tried back on, and Vincent Reed took an amazing catch. And we were, you know, doing all sorts of things on the field, and and and, and just kept pressurizing, Pre pressure on the batsmen. You know what I mean? And eventually, they they had they they had to succumb, and it was just an unbelievable experience. At, at the end of the game, it was it was like excitement you never see. Children in Somerset, born after 1959, had never seen a victory. So for 20 years, they lived in, in defeat. And now this, this grand day has arrived. It was like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. Somerset have taken the cup from St. George's in such a fashion. It was like an uh, unbelievable experience. The excitement is, um, took me about a half hour to get off the field. The crowd rushed onto the field. People were so excited with the Somerset winning. And, yeah, marching, marching the team down to the pier and back. Uh, was, it, was, it was a scene of activities and excitement and, you know, something that uh, you'll never forget the rest of your life to have an experience like that. Because that, that game in Brafaris Bermuda, standard of cricket, that is the ultimate game in our local domestic scene, you know. So it was excitement to the, to the highest, man. <laughs> Even though it was a historic win, a really great win, Many did not expect for a victory that day because we bet they, when we declared our innings, I think it was 3.30 in the afternoon on the second day. And of course, you know, that's not a lot of time to dismiss another team, but um, we went through them pretty quickly. I think they got 60 something runs and, and, and it was great. It was, a, it was a great victory. I lost my shirt, my hat. All type of things trying to get off the field that day. Somerset fans were very, very happy. Um, obviously, Somerset hadn't won for 20 years. There were a lot of people in the island, a lot of young people especially, who had never ever seen Somerset win a game. Uh, and so uh, when we uh, were looking like uh, we were going to win that, catch, that match, it was absolutely amazing uh, what happened uh, around that field and the number of people that came. And, and as I looked out, I can remember vividly looking up and looking around the ground and could see no concrete or all you could see was people uh, that's how many people uh, had really been uh, drawn into the game because Somerset hadn't won for uh, since 1950 um, in the 50s you know 59 I think it was something like that. anyway it had been 20 years about 20 years since we uh, had had won the match so it was uh, it was very exciting and to be the captain of course has uh, made it um, made it extra special it was a successful cup match. Uh, after 20 years, uh, we guys never even won the trophy. So, you know, it was an honor and a privilege to uh, be part of that team to win back uh, the trophy in Somerset after 20 years. I remember it well. It was an empty feeling. You were getting jeered by the spectators, the Somerset spectators, stuff like that. But uh, that's, uh, that's all a part of uh, <clears throat> making you a, a man, per se. You, you, know, you learn how to absorb things like that. You try not to let it bother you, but if I say it don't, I'll be lying. But you soon realize that that's a part of the game. You can't win everything, and someone is going to win at some point in time. Sometimes it goes against the grain, sometimes it don't. So you've just got to take the, the thick with the thin, as the saying goes. After the match, they had that huge tree up on the um, southern boundary of uh, Somerset. And I just sat there and just watched for about a half an hour the crowd and just the euphoria and elation and the joy that came over the Somerset supporters. And it, it made me realize on that day what cup match meant because I grew up for 18 years seeing St. George's win or draw. Um, but it was a special occasion. Somerset deserved to win. Randy Horton skipped his team well. He had Colin Blades, Rob, Robert Hines. Um, Coach Rock, Al James, a, a fantastic team. They they deserved to win. They did so, and and I think, in honesty, it was probably for the betterment of cricket because just like in the Eastern County, if you got the same team that's winning over and over, it doesn't give the other teams much uh, to look forward to. But it, it was a special moment. I just soaked in the atmosphere and, and marveled at the um, the crowd, just how they bounced around like a a beehive. Outside, press ball six. Yeah. Oh my. My, my, my. Anyone would have thought he had been there for an hour. <laughs> he just picked that ball up very quickly and ripped it through to the long leg, long one body for six. I 
is a good hand. Got my cricket bat and bull. And since it's mine, I'm first. And, and I, I got to tell you, um, he, he wouldn't have been able to score a six off of me. Many batsmen have stamped their authority on cup match, but none more emphatically than Somerset's prolific run-getter, Gennaro Tucker, who has amassed more runs than any other batsman in cup match and is the only player to date to score four centuries in the Classics history. So what is it that gets Tucker's juices flowing on the big occasion? When you look around the, around the field, the atmosphere I live, you got people just enjoying the two days of cup match, sitting off, you know, partying, music, drinking. So when it comes to me, it's like they've come to see me. So it's like my time for me to say, you've come, you've paid to, to see me, and now it's my time to say, I'm going to show you what I can do. And that's what it's all about. So I set my mind to doing certain things, and it just happens. And, and I just follow through with it. And I just make sure that whatever they've paid, they're happy that I've entertained them. In 2001, Tucker produced Cup Match's highest innings at Wellington Oval, a majestic 186 that surpassed Lloyd James's previous record of 173 not out that had stood for 39 years. I really wasn't really playing to break the record um, until I got to like 150. And once I got to 150, um, I think it was Clay came to me and says, do you know what's, what's the next target? Like, I'm like, Whatever, like, you know, what, what is it? It's like, oh, the uh, cup match racket. So um, I didn't want to really put my mind on it because I want to continue to play my game and um, just try to get there as quick as possible rather than ones, twos. So I thought, I'm just going to continue to play. Whatever happens, happens. And once I reached that milestone, it was like, <laughs> I was just ecstatic like that it really happened. It was really, it was joyful for me, and to watch everybody come on the field, my mother, my father, all these summers of people, it was, it was great. It was a good feeling. When he broke Lloyd James' record, hey, that was a great achievement that he accomplished. And it made me feel proud, my wife and I, and the family, and everybody else as a fan. You know, it was a great achievement. Certainly, of all the batsmen I've seen, I, I rate today right there with the best. Uh, and, and I tell you, you know, when, when I look at Somerset, I've always, you know, I look at Somerset batsmen that I've, that I've seen, I always say Colin, you know, Colin Blaze to me uh, was a batsman uh, who looked like he would never get out, you know, when he, when he came to the Wicklow game. And Gennaro Tucker is like that too. And when Gennaro comes to the wicket, it don't look like you can ever get him out. He's a great bat. Now Gennaro, he, he, he's one of the best, the best bats, as far as I'm concerned, in Bermuda. Gennaro, he, he's, he's, if he stayed in cup match in all three or four years, he'd get about three more centuries. Because the ball is the standard now, it's, it's medium to straight. There's no ball that's uh, really, that you can say, it's, um, match winning ballers. Hoping that something happens. So with Gennaro's mentality, if he, can, if he stays in all three years, he probably got another three or four wickets, four um, centuries. Watching my father play cup match, um, it was always something that I wanted to do. So once I started playing cricket, I said, well, this is where I'm going to make sure I, I got a part of this, this classic. It makes me feel great, you know, just to sit back and watch Gennaro. From all the talent that he has, I was part of that organization of showing him how to play cricket, how to bat and do other little, uh, other things. I used to play a lot of cricket in Rangers Park a lot. Um, I used to go home, got my cricket bat and ball, and since it's mine, I'm first. So I used to get the trash can, bring it in the car park, and I'm first. And we used to, that's how we used to play. Um, sometimes they want to cheat me out, so I'll take my bat and ball and I'm getting there. But they used to say, all right, look, you come back in, you got another hit. So that's how, I, you know, it, it that's how, that's how it happened, and that's how I developed playing with older guys in the parking lot, and that's pretty much in a nutshell. Tucker is among a handful of players to have scored 1,000 runs or more in cup match, and the only Somerset player to have achieved the feat to date. The 
the first player to amass 1,000 runs in cup match was former St. George's skipper Wendell Smith, who reached a milestone in 1992 at Wellington Oval. What made that special to me was the fact that my grandfather passed that May, and the year before I was dismissed on 96, and he let me know in no uncertain terms that I should have scored a century. So when he passed in hospital, I closed my eyes. I watched him die. I closed my eyes and told him that. Uh, on his deathbed, I promise you I'll get you a century this year. And uh, though he had moved on to um, another place, I, it was in my mind that cut said I would honor his name and score a century. And, and that was the clan I both scored a century. The actual run was a ball that was on my pads. So I just turned around the corner and Dax Smith called for a quick single. And uh, I was happy to, um, to reach that milestone. But, but to be honest, it was never, about personal milestones. I enjoy playing in St. George's where we had a really good team. I, I was fortunate to play people like Charlie Marshall, Noel Gibbons, Cleve Wade, Arnold Mendes, guys who truly love the game. The distinction of being the first player to score 1,000 runs in cup match could have easily gone to St. George's Lloyd James who bowed out of the classic with 988 runs under his belt while still at the top of his game. Cup match to me didn't have its, the, the meaning like seems as if people lost interest because I kind of lost interest because we were winning too much and I can remember like even in displaying my St. George colors you go out and a lot of people wouldn't wear the colors if they were Somerset and I can remember one year on the second day all the Somerset colors were free umbrellas Somerset red and blue free they couldn't sell them St. George's umbrella, the price doubled. So it kind of took away the, the fighting spirit that I had for cup match. And I said, well, people are not that interested in cup match anymore. Little did I realize, and when, especially when I saw the year that Summers had won, those people, all of that hidden spirit was just pressed down because of this St. George's power. But once Summers had won, whoo! You know, so many people, ah, oh, you know, coming at me like, we got you now, you know. But if I had, if, if I, if I had felt that spirit while I was playing, you know, down my later, later years, then I guess I would probably pay it, play it on. James retired from cup match in 1974, the same year teammates Rupert Scotland and Lee Rayner produced the Classics highest betting partnership at Somerset Cricket Club. The pair produced an unbeaten 229-run six-wicket stand with the late Scotland scoring 120 and Rayner an even 100. This year marks the 40th anniversary of that remarkable feat. Rupert's, see, batting is like your personality. Rupert was a brutal, he was a brutal batsman. Sweet cut and he liked to hit the ball hard. I was, I like to think of myself more science, more scientific. So um, I think it, it made a good match. In the middle there were, he was brutal, but, uh, and I was more science. So we sort of made it like, we hooked up and made, made like, like a good, um, a good partnership, a good, um, you know, we just worked out where our thing was in tune. In other words, we were in tune with one another. Scotty took his game very, very seriously. Uh, a vicious cut and pull of the cricket ball, and one who, uh, who I would say valued his wicket a whole lot. Uh, Rupert wasn't the type of person who believed in backing away just to give somebody a slot. If you were good enough, earn it. He believed in that. He was a very, very good cricketer and he took his game very, very seriously. He was um, a treat to watch and to play with and to bat with. Um, he's colorful. Very colorful and his stroke play, he wasn't a slugger. Rupert was a, a hard hitter of the ball, but he kept the ball on the ground. If he had to hit the ball of the, out of the ground, it'd be uh, professional. It would be like sort of in a professional way, he'll, he'll do it. You know, he wouldn't just slug. Parfit, for me, is the best ball I've seen in Bermuda. Daniel Green, right? I call him the best wicket keeper in the world.
Another name synonymous with cup match is Wiley St. George's spin bowler Clarence Parfit, the classic's all-time leading wicket-taker. During a phenomenal cup match career spanning 16 years, Parfit claimed 115 wickets with best bowling figures of 9 for 47. Parfit is the best bowler. Best bowler uh, Bermuda's ever produced and, a lot, and best bowler. Parfit can compare with a test bowler. Test bowler so. He is a... Um, he was a left arm, medium pace, leg break bowler. He was quicker than the average spinner. Quicker. Um, he had the ability to, to move the ball in and out. Um, and during my time, Parfit was, I would say, the best. Parfit's the best bowler that I've ever seen. Because he wasn't slow. He could take the new ball, and when he slowed it up, I mean, that ball, I mean, it moved, you know, and he had plenty of control. He just didn't bowl, but he had control. And I felt sorry for a lot of the, uh, the players that feared him, because if you feared him, you were out before you came in. A few times uh, he had to bowl me in the final trial match, during trial matches, and I was very nervous, because I know I'm, I'm betting against the number one spin bowler in the island. So I was very nervous and so forth, but he made me, he encouraged me to concentrate as much as possible, which was a good thing. Parfit, for me, is the best bowler I've seen in Bermuda. Uh, I've played with him with the Bermuda Wanderers. If he told me to stay a, a foot away from the bat and you're going to be safe, I felt safe. He had such good control. I think the, the different things he was able to do with the ball, uh, he would read a batsman um, and he would apply uh, different you know, applications to the main ball, you know, away swing, or in swing, he'd cut it, swing it back. There were so many variations that he had. He was the type of person that, that actually had a passion for the game. And he didn't like the idea, I, I really think he just didn't like the idea of somebody scoring off him. And he doubled up to figure out how can I get you one last score and two to, to get you up. And he was so deceptive in his delivery. I mean, he, he was a medium, a medium spin, but the things he used to do, I used to admire a lot about. So how you do that? <laughs> he was a cut above, you know, and I don't, I think it was in 75, I think in one he got nine wickets. And you're wondering, well, why is this guy getting these wickets? Why no one else could? But it was because of his disciplines, you know, his lines, his lengths, they were so good, you know? They were so much better than anyone else. He hardly gave you a loose ball. The guy was phenomenal. There's no two ways about that. Even the test players had trouble with the many ball servers, like the first ball of Somerset. And um, he gave Kent Barrington trouble. He gave Boycott trouble test, test bowlers. He is the best bowler that the Mills are produced. Parfit is one of only two bowlers to have claimed 100 or more wickets in cup match. The first to achieve the milestone was another former St. George's left arm spinner, Alec Cocky Steed, who claimed 100 wickets between 1922 and 1951. Cocky, Cocky is different from bowling from Clarence. Cocky was a slow bowler, spinning. Clarence like a medium fast bowler. He can spin when he wants to, but, both, but Clarence had a more variation to my opinion than cocky. Clarence was turning the ball both ways. I think cocky only could take the ball away from me, but now and then he gave me a straight one. He was a master spin builder. As, as a matter of fact, his slow uh, left arm builders, I said, uh, off break to a right hand, the best one he gave his name, over so he called it the Cerilla. <laughs> And he could almost break, break square of the wicket. Great build. And then the change up was more or less look like she's coming straight. She just gave a little turn to you, away from the best one. And, and that was his, his weapon. And it worked very well for years, years and years. My father was the captain of the cup match, Team St. George Cup match, long before me. And while saying that, Alex Cocky Steed was my brother-in-law, and, and in fact, Alec Cockestia played his first cup match in 1922, and my father was captain, and 
and at that time I was one year old, one year old, and I had the very great privilege of playing with her at the Cocker Skate for a number of years. I joined the Wellington St. George's Cricket Club in 1939, so to speak. When I, uh, I played my first cup match in 1941, and the Valley Cocker I played with, with him uh, for about five times, so to speak. One of the classic's most outstanding fielders is former St. George's wicketkeeper Dennis Wainwright, who executed 37 dismissals between 1957 and 1977. It is a record that remains to this day. Dennis Wainwright, I call him the best wicketkeeper in the world, because he could have played to any country behind the wickets. World class. There's no two ways about that. He was of the highest standard. I didn't become a great wicket keep just by sheer um, gift. I had a gift, I had very quick reflexes, I had a good eye, but I worked hard. I worked hard, I, I worked, and I earned the position, I earned the, 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 the status of being the best. So I dare not any, no one dare tell me that I wasn't the best because I worked hard, you know, and I don't think any any um, wicket keep or fields who worked harder than I did as a keeper. And I did things that in a match that, that people wondered how did I do it, how, how, it's because I practiced, practiced, practiced. As a young boy growing up, I, I, I read a lot about Alan Knott, one of the greatest wicket keepers in the world, I figured, and, and his training, his training habits and it, it, the way he developed himself and then watching Dennis Rain right keep working, unbelievable. So. You know, that, that was inspired me to um, become a wicket keeper. Definitely a legend in the game of cup match. You know, you think the amount of years that he played, and you know the the um, the rule that St George's was on when he you know when he got into the game for years, with fellas like Bommy Simons and Kenny Paul and Clarence Parf and Alfred Fleasel, Lloyd James, Lee Rand, Elder, unbelievable team. You know, batting all the way down to number ten. Every so often, cup match on Earth's a real jam as was the case in 1980 when teenage St. George's coach Charlie Marshall emphatically announced his arrival on the big stage. With a six off the last ball of a drawn affair at Wellington Oval, Marshall became the first coach to score a century on their cup match debut. After I completed Brother Spencer's record, 75, it was a water break just after that. And that's when my, my captain Neverdell came to the week and said, Charlie, look, you can you can reach some, some milestones here. You can you can get 100 because it's sufficient time left. So I'm not going to call the game with like three hours left. So that's when I decided to take my time. I had great support at that time from Cam, Cam Pitcher. Uh, Cam Pitcher, and we were just working the ball around at the time. And I think when I got to the wicket, he was in his maybe early 80s. And, you know, this was, so we had quite a few overs left in the match. I think it was about five or six more overs left. The big question was, can he get a century? That was the big, big topic around the field. And I remember when Navodar, who was the skipper then, he said, put on the pants. If the next one good, you're going out. I said, oh man, I'm not a bad at this early, even regularly. But I went out there and, and you could feel the tension. You know, guys like Randy Horton, these guys, these, these guys are fierce competitors. And when I got to the wicket, you heard the talk. You know, the, the chanting and, you know, let's get him, let's get him. Make sure he doesn't get a sign. This is for a Somerset player. When other coaches come, yeah, you know, you always give them a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a hammer. But um, uh, but Charlie was a, um, you know, he was he was always a good competitor right from the beginning, right from uh, from when he was a coach. And, and um, you know, he he was a tough nut, so um, you know, it wasn't easy to crack. Came down to the last over. He was in his nineties, and he had to strike. He got a boundary and put it up. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the scores were. But in any case, three balls left. Charlie was on strike. I said, well, you know, hey, you only need six more. You can do it. You maintain the strike. For some reason, we ran on, the, on the, the third last ball, the fourth ball of the over. I was like, what are you doing? You know, I couldn't believe that. I, I, it may have been where somebody cut off a body. Who knows? I can't remember, but here I am, I'm got the strike. Two balls left in the game. I'm like, oh man, you know, this, this is, you know, this is pressure. 
You know, we were both 18. New to the game, cult. He's on the threshold of history. And I'm in the middle of sharing the stage with him. So I, you know, I, I, we met in the middle. I said, listen, you know, even if I got clean, though, man, Robert Hines, he wasn't a real threat by that time. Yeah, I had my side here. I said, even if I got clean, though, kid, okay, just run. Ken Pitcher was on strike, and I knew I had to get down to the other end. And the ball went to the wicketkeeper, and uh, I just ran. I said, Cam, we just got to run. You know, and that's what happened. And I got down to the, I was on strike at the time, and um, Robert Hines built me this delicious ice, I call it the ice cream ball, ice cream ball, and I had no other choice to, to hit him outside. He wouldn't have been able to score six off of me as easily as he scored it off of uh, Robert Hines on the last ball. But Charlie's eyes were so good at that time, probably no matter where uh, a bowler had put that ball, uh, he would have probably met it, you know, he was, he was just in such good form. And, um, you know, all, all, all props to him, you know, I congratulated him uh, uh, for it. And he's going on to be, again, you know, one of our, uh, one of our best. He certainly, you know, Somerset, you know, have always been happy to see his back when he's coming up to that. And they've had to wait a long while, most of the time, before they saw his back walking to the pavilion. Both Noel and I got injured in that game. We were both hit in the head by Horton. And I could remember we were both in the uh, emergency room and we had beds <laughs> close to each other and Noel had gotten struck, I think, above on his nose or something like that. I got hit firmly in the head. And obviously he's, he's speaking with a rattled voice, Tom, talk, talk, you heard that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but yeah, uh, it was a phenomenal inning by Charles. I got back to the ground in time to see him hit the last ball, I think it was for six to get to a hundred. While one can appreciate the sporting aspect of cup match, it is important to understand the true significance of the occasion which commemorates the abolition of slavery. It symbolizes freedom. And if we don't have that, then we stand a chance of losing so much. So it is, it is vitally important that anyone that gets involved in Somerset Cricket Club or St. George's Cricket Club as part of the management team, the executive team, and even the membership has to understand that there's a, an event that comes the, f the last Thursday and Friday before the first Monday in August that is vital and we have to do everything we can to ensure that that event is carried out. To me, this is almost like an Independence Day celebration for us. I know we're not an independent country, but we're celebrating the, celebrating the emancipation of slaves. And for those who came before us, who fought hard for all the good things that we have within our island today, this is what we have to start talking about. And the thing that I want to know, want to get one point is to get, as a school teacher, I think it's important that this needs to be within our, within our educational system. One thing I do as, as a health and physical education teacher is instill that my boys and even the young ladies know what cup match is about. Because there are some kids who really don't know the importance of it. Um, this, to me, is the, is the Bermuda Day of our whole year. Yeah. When you think of what is celebrated that day, and you think of all the people before you, uh, and, and that you're celebrating the, not just a match, but a fight. You know, when, when you think of slavery, and that's the reason the match was celebrated. That is what really captivated me to play cup match. There are quite a few people who don't even know the relevance of cup match. Uh, and when you delve into history, you find out that hitting the ball around is just a very minor part of uh, what this thing is all about. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have, but I hope you've enjoyed the show. See you next time.